So in the context of building a new school, we could start with an empty slate. And the question was, we knew a lot about the science of learning, but almost no one has applied the science of learning to them. So this was a chance to work with the government, to say, let's try it out. If it works, we keep it. If it fails, we go back to the old model. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is to give you a little bit of a sense of what is learning, how learning actually transpires. Uh, and I think we're all from different backgrounds, so stop me anytime. Because the first rule is don't do what I'm doing now. This is the worst way of teaching. Lectures just don't work. We know for a fact. For a fact. 41 randomized studies have shown it has no effect. But it feels good. It feels good. It feels good. very good. Very important. Right? Okay. So what I'm going to do, very, uh, give you sort of an overview. I'm going to stop. I like it to be interactive because otherwise you'll only remember two things in one month. You saw me. <laughs> and the second thing I remember is I said something about learning, and then it's all done. So I don't want that to happen, so I like it to be interactive. Is that okay? Thank you. So learn science of learning, learn the rules of learning, which may not be, you may not be so aware, because some of them are actually counterintuitive. And the third is application to training, which I'll show you how we did it in a medical school, and if there is a video link, I'll show you how we do it in a secondary school for sixth grade students. Because we started as a medical school, but we've gone into teaching, how to look, I mean, teaching learning. So our focus is learning. Okay, so I just want to go very quickly through one piece of it. One of the reasons why there is a lot of interest now, it wasn't there when we started in 2007, is everybody is getting very worried that our students are not learning yes. what they need in this new world. Because all the learning for the last 100 years has focused on one thing, how much you store there. Yes. It hasn't focused on the two things that you have listed here, decision making and negotiation, persuasion, communication. You don't have that, your value, you will never beat Google. Your brain is never going to be as much information as Google. If you are in that level, how, what skills do you really need in this new world? So the OECD, which is the Organization of Economic Development, said these are the seven core skills, and I will just very briefly say, you all know about literacy, but actually what is very interesting is students nowadays don't know how to write. Big problem. Because the world they're going into, the computers can now write better than they do. They're expecting the computers to correct their grammar. They're depending on word to do a lot of stuff. They're forgetting there is a certain rule in architecture. So literacy is more than reading. It is actually how to decode the intent of what is in the text. In the old days, they used to teach that. But now, it's basically disappeared because of what you would call commoditization of education. To try to teach thousands of people, in the process you lost some of what you're really trying to do. So this is what the OECD is talking about. Numeracy, interestingly, it is not just math. Okay, people can do math. But what you need to do is why you need to know how to do that. How do you apply it? How do you communicate it? Heavily linked, by the way, to literacy. And it is also linked. So there's actually lots of cognitive elements, thinking elements. It also comes into beliefs, habits of mind, etc. Which if you're going to have somebody talk on decision making, it's going to come heavily into this. Now interestingly, we actually know how numeracy develops in the brain. So numeracy, or number counting, is not a human thing, by the way. It is there in animals. Pigeons have it, rabbits have it, honeybees have it, insects. Okay? How do we know that? You can look at the in psychological experiments or cognitive experiments. You can actually show how an animal reacts or a bird reacts when you show one object, two objects, three objects, and more objects. Usually, animals can basically distinguish roughly between three to five. By the way, that's exactly the same for babies. Otherwise, it's too much, too numerous. Most humans, quick, very, very fast, you're about seven to eight, that's it. Okay, everything else, you actually have to extrapolate, focus, 
and figure out ways to do it. So it is in a very tiny location in the brain called the intraparietal sulcus. We can actually identify which part of the brain. And a very tiny percentage of humans have difficulty with it. And it's called dyscalculia. Very tiny percentage. We can identify them pretty early on. You can identify them with what's called a number game very, very early. Probably by the age of two, three, you can find them. And therefore, the question always is, can you do something about it? Answer is we don't know. Interestingly, if your primary language is Mandarin, you actually do better. Lower rates of dyscalculia than if your primary language is English. It probably has to do with how your brain focuses on symbols. Okay, we don't know the science behind it. It's something, as you get research, you have to look at it. The big issue is problem solving. This is what everybody needs in this new world. You need to know where to find what you need and how to apply it to solve something that somebody wants. Because if you don't, there is what's called the big donut problem. The big donut, you know a donut. It's a big hole in the middle, round it. That hole is getting bigger and bigger. That hole is being replaced by computers. Okay, so the type of jobs that are going to be there which require routine cognitive skills, including driving, including being a pilot on a plane, or driving a huge oil tanker are all slowly being replaced by computer systems. Because their routine cognitive skills and the extension of anything that can be programmable is extending further and further up. So the type of skills a human needs is either on one side, which is using your hands to do things that others' current systems cannot do, or the other side, creating the systems in the middle that replaces other people. It's called the big donor, and the donut is expanding. And by the way, problem solving actually requires something a little different from this focused attention. The more you focus on something, and your attention is really, really tight on it, the less you're able to connect it to other things that you know. It's called wide versus narrow attention. And there are experimental ways to look at it. And it's actually a very tiny region of the brain, again, that seems to be very involved in it, called the anterior cingulate cortex. I won't do the science too much because you have a very broad background. I just want to hint to you, every one of these things is a science underneath it. That science is very, very early, meaning there's a lot of scope for people to do research. Okay. And most of what I'm telling you is the problem of statistics. This is valid for most people, may not be valid for a few. Okay, just keep that in mind. Okay, the big thing now is how to work in teams, groups, because that's life. All work now is groups and teams. And you need to know how to communicate, how to negotiate, how to persuade. And then <coughs> this is a big thing. The only point I want to make on communication is communication is not what I'm doing to you alone, but what you, what do you hear of what I'm telling you, and vice versa, what do I interpret what you say? Which is a really a skill, by the way. It's not totally natural for some people. In fact, for most people. For some, it's very natural. If you're a very good politician, you really know it. You don't need anyone to train you. You are too, right? Huh? You are a politician too. I don't know about a politician, but uh, <laughs> we actually train people. And I got trained. So. Yes. <laughs> you're a <the> father. <laughs> I need it, right? This is the other thing. The one big thing which tells you who's going to succeed and who doesn't is the ability to delay gratification, meaning wait, wait. it's called the marshmallow test. The kid who can wait for the second marshmallow will do much better in life, even if his intelligence is lower than another kid. In fact, the data suggests a two to one ratio. So intelligence predicting how well you do in life versus simple marshmallow test predicting how well you do in life is roughly two to one. Okay. Important thing, potentially learnable. It's called the if-then principle. And I'm not going to get into those because it will be too detailed but there are ways to teach it. It's a type of cognitive therapy. Okay, and this is the most important thing that's happening now, is if those of us who are getting into the job market now can expect you'll have to keep changing jobs. That means you have to keep learning. And the skills you need will have to change, and this is lifelong learning. By the way, the word for this is eutagogy, not pedagogy. Pedagogy is for kids. Eutagogy is lifelong learning. So the habit for learning is a habit that is going to be essential. And that starts in schools, very hard to actually inculcate in colleges. 
You really need to do it early, early on. Ah, this one. Lectures do not work. If you want to look at it, there are plenty of studies. <laughs> they have compared it to just giving a book or giving you material or uh, even saying go read the internet. <laughs> this is the type of randomized studies that have been done. 41 of them. Somebody really believed in lectures to keep spending so much money <laughs> running randomized studies. And it, by the way, it didn't matter how good the lecturer was. It did not make a difference. Zero difference, which is interesting. And it has to do with how the brain works. Okay? When you're passively listening, the more you feel like I know, the less you'll remember. Because your brain is automatically discarding the whole thing. So the more persuasive I am right now, you will not remember this. But look at this. There's a paper by Gibbs. And you can see it. It's on the net. It's called 20 Terrible Reasons for Lecture. Okay? The only good thing about lecturing is it's an easy way of saying I did my job. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but it doesn't work. Okay, we actually have a lot of data on this. If you do a lecture, the most you're going to get is in the first five to ten minutes, and the last in the last five to ten minutes. So my first ten minutes to tell you lectures don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay. The problem now is in, I don't know about here, but many many universities are running mass classes. 500 kids in a room. They don't even know the kids are coming. They don't know what the kids are doing. Yes. All they're doing is they're providing the thing on a huge blackboard or automated systems. And no one cares about whether they learn. If the child or the young adult has an aptitude, they're going to do fine. The 1% of every class, no matter what you do, is going to do fine. The bulk in the middle will muddle along. The people in the lower end don't do well. And the role of the university is not for the one percent. The role of the university is to try to get everyone to some competence in whatever you said you do for them. I think there is a social contract that we all forget. And I'll come back to it in a couple of minutes. So the only way things work is if I get you engaged. The more you're engaged, the more likely you'll remember because your brain is using a lot more. Okay, it's focusing. It's using, and I'll get to some of the simple rules that actually come into it. And most of what I'm doing now, I'm going to connect into a set of rules to it. And then we'll try to see, based on the class you gave me, how could you work on it. If we can do it today, we will. Otherwise, we'll try doing it tomorrow. And if any of you have another class you want to bring, bring it over tomorrow. That way, I don't have to keep asking you to ask them to ask for a class. Okay. This is the other problem. Uh, Microsoft has done a lot of studies to show the level of distraction now is getting much worse. Very hard for people to keep this thing in their pocket. Okay, sooner or later you feel like that. I see who's Facebook or who's sending something. So your mind, even if you turn it off, keeps going back to turning it back off. So the level of attention span has gone down. And an interesting problem is everyone thinks I can do two things at a time, or three things at a time. Interestingly, all the cognitive science data, including imaging data, suggests not true. In fact, the people who say I can do two things at the same time do less well than the person who says I don't do two things so well, which is interesting. Okay. Okay, this is the teamwork part. This is the problem. All our education in the past has just been focused on this. How much information, I'm using the word information, can I shove into somebody's head? So you almost feel like, when I give a lecture, I've got to take everything I know, do it in one hour, and I'm done. Can you? What? No, you can can't. You? Cannot. At all. At all. And we actually know that intuitively from our own learning, but we also know it from randomized controlled trials. There's no better evidence than randomized trials, by the way. Okay, this is the other problem. There's a massive knowledge explosion, so no matter how much content you want to pour into somebody's head, never will be enough. Okay, so the beginning is motivation. So I'm not going to get into the science of it in great detail, mostly for to keep it interesting and second, not to get into too much depth on every, any of them. By the way, there's an enormous amount of literature on this one. But I'm going to try making it into a way in which you can communicate to others. And these are the key rules for motivation. Motivation means wanting to do something. 
And motivation can come because you are really, really interested. Intrinsic motivation. Or it's coming because of outside factors. But there are four components to it. The first one is whatever you're interested in, for you to sustain an interest or motivation, you need have to have the ability to do it. You want to be a professional basketball player and you're four feet six, not going to work, right? You need some ability. The second is you actually have to think, if I do this, I'm going to get something out of it. This is not the, the curiosity driven, driven one is innate to us. This is when you have to do something that you're not particularly really want to do. How do you persuade yourself to start it and keep it? So benefit means you need to feel like, so okay, I want to go to medical school. I need to study hard to get these grades to do it. The third thing which everyone forgets to some extent is what's called confidence. If you don't have confidence that you will succeed, you will not. Confidence actually to sustain it comes from a few key principles which we'll get at later. But confidence, you need it at the beginning to start. Most important way is if you're already overconfident, no problem, but re-sustaining it is a problem. <laughs> but if you're not confident, if you see your friend who you think is just as good as you succeed in doing something, you're more likely to be confident than if you see him fail. You see him fail, and you know it from your own experience. None of what I'm telling you should feel totally extrinsic to you, except when I get into the science of how you remember things. Some of them will be totally counterintuitive. Okay, and desire, meaning it's not just benefit, but there's more than benefit to it. Okay, the benefit is like getting you started. But to sustain it, there's going to be something, something that keeps you going. And that's the term desire. So I call these four things the ABCD of motivation. What about F? Hmm? F, fail. Fail without and then you'll start yeah. these things. <laughs> without this, nothing will work. When you fail, you'll start. These yeah. So this is something that we actually know animal side. It goes back to 1931. And they actually found it very interesting. They put rats on one side, put an electrical grid on the other, and on the other side they'll keep something interesting, novel, the rat hadn't seen. Eat, and then they'll leave food on the same side of the rat. Interestingly, any time a novel thing was introduced, the rat would take those electric shocks and go and explore what it is. And monkeys do exactly the same. And all you need to do is if you have monkey studies going on, try dropping something there, they will look at it first rather than the food. Anything normal. The why. Hmm? Why? Why, why, the, why the animal can survive? Do the whole thing comes to how humans and animals survive. Novelty is always something that tells you there's a change in the environment. You better figure out it's good or bad. Everything. Insects, humans, whatever. Our brains were built for one purpose, survival. Our survival and survival of the species. It's constantly learning and adapting to help you survive. But why do students do not have this kind of intrinsic motivation? Because you have squenching. <laughs> they do. Do you have your children? Do you have children? Yeah, yeah. What were they doing when they were six months old and one year old? What you did is you squelched it. Yes. Totally they, squelched it. They, they lost it. They lose it because they actually figure out if they keep asking questions, they say, stop asking questions. Okay? Very common. All of us do it, including me. Okay? Before, interestingly, I never connected my own science and the science of the large group that I had with learning. I only did it when I went to Singapore. It never connected in the past, even though I had a huge enterprise. We used to put, produce probably 1,500 1, odd papers, 1,000 to 1,500 1, odd papers a year. Massive group. All my psychologists were either in motivation, learning, mood, attention, perception, all those things. But none of them, including myself, ever connected it to learning. Never applied. Singapore was the first time we did it. But every element of it has been known for a very long time. From animals to humans. Why is actually a very interesting question. It's actually called epistemic curiosity. We're all built with it. It just gets, and when you're a baby, that's how you learn. You're learning by exploration. Okay. And you can actually show a lot of uh, ways to test for these in 
And if you have a lab, you can run these experiments to show how people are and what's the variance. So you'll always find in a group, small percentage, some or other you can't suppress the curiosity. Okay? And they're the ones who are the risk takers, who are doing things, creating things, probably the entrepreneurs who really build the economy in most countries. And that includes here. Hong Kong is known for those. Those people are not the ones who studied really hard, went through exams and did that. They were the ones who left. Many. And you see it in the US. Okay. We actually know the brain system is connected to it. It involves a chemical called dopamine. And there is a genetic predisposition, very small, that you can show some people are more prone towards risk than others. And part of it is connected to it. You can actually do it with what's called the balloon test. That's a gambling test. And you can actually show by the gambling test where people fall in different groups. Like anything else, this has a U-shaped curve. Too much of it, no good. Too little of it, no good. Right in the middle is where it works best. Too much of it is usually you're going to do things that will eventually not work out in your field. Too little of it, you never do anything. It's in the middle. It's called the Goldilocks principle. So, motivation is what directs attention to anything. Why did you come here? You oh, came to huh? see you. See me. Thank you. Yeah. But you came also because you were interested in the topic. Right? Motivation drives attention. But even in a room, who are you going to go and talk to? It's based on your interest, what you want, etc. But if something really novel happens in the room, everybody attention goes there, right? That's the nature of things. That is, that's how our brains are wired. It's called selective attention, and it is very much based on a simple principle that our brains were built for survival and its attention mechanisms are built for it. Attention drives perception. Perception is how we see what we see or how we hear what we hear. And actually, very interesting thing is, it is not what we think the camera is recording. <coughs> okay, our perception is actually a blend of what is recorded through the eyes and what we expect it to be. It's a blend of the two. Okay, very important, and I'll show it to you in a second. Perception leads to memory, memory to learning, and that's how the whole cycle works. So, this is a classic test that the people do. This gray and this one, what do you think the intensity is? Which one is lighter, which one is darker in this, the sentence? What does your brain say? Which one is darker left? Okay. It's actually identical. But your brain is perceiving it based on the natural contrast around it. Once you know it, like I just told you, you, your brain is going to say, yeah, it is, but it is not. I know what it is. That's what's called the, the top-down versus bottom. This is also interesting. This actually, these are actually the same, these two. But your brain is saying this one is red, and that's gray. Exactly the same. And if you do the color spectrum, you can show it's exactly the same. And it's not just this, it's movements. Now, if I do a very, and I, don't, I didn't bring all this, because I, I do a separate on this for perception. If I just invert your face, you can't recognize it. If I do right, left, I, you can't, because your brain expects something. When it's outside the expectation, its perception gets impaired. Also, you all know, if you go to a country where everyone looks very, very different, distinguishing between them is harder than for distinguishing people which your familiar faces with. Again, it's based on learning. That's how your brain's got designed. Very tiny area of the brain, by the way. If you actually damage this area of the brain, it doesn't work. Our brains are very specialized to help us survive. The mechanism for underlying, underlying it has a top-down part and a bottom-up part. But the main principle is we don't see what we think we do brain actually makes it and interprets it to what we need to survive. Okay, this is probably the most important thing. And how many of you have heard of this? <coughs> okay, you're in psychology. So if you didn't hear of it, then it's a problem. <laughs> Everybody else, this is the most important curve 
if you're going to teach anybody, you need to know. It's called the forgetting curve, and this goes back to what I started in the beginning. This is somebody who actually started the science of memory in many, many ways, and he experimented on one person himself. Very, uh, clearly very obsessive person, but played a major role in setting the science of forgetting in place. It's called the forgetting curve. Basic elements are if it is something that you don't know anything about, and you can't connect it to anything else, and you have to keep it in your brain, how long will it last? Okay, you lose 50% of what you learn, roughly, in 19 minutes. If you can't connect it to anything else, it's totally random. So you went to a physics lecture on quantum physics, and you have no idea what physics is. Odds are in 20 minutes, you have no idea what he taught. It's all gone. Okay, if you don't connect, it's gone. Most important is in 31 days, almost nothing is left. Which is why lectures don't work. This study was done in the 1860s. We have known this since then. And you'll actually find articles talking about why lectures don't work, dating back to the 1890s. But there is a reason. Do you know why classrooms are set the way they are? Anybody? Why do you have rows of students? Easy to control. Yeah. And who do you think came up with that idea? The teacher. No. The one time. One ruler. No. One ruler of Prussia, Frederick. He decided he didn't want kids to ask any questions. Keep them all silent, in rows, make them do something over and over and over. And that's it. He didn't want them to think. He just wanted them to do. All education started, stopped at roughly 10 years old, and then you were ready for work. He only thought that an elite group should really learn. Everybody else should really learn to do the work they need. This was prior to the Industrial Revolution. Problem is this was introduced in the US in 1880s, introduced everywhere, and never got. Same system is stuck because it's a very efficient way of saying I did my job. But what you're actually doing, and I understand this is an exam week for you, all you're doing in an exam is assessing aptitude. You're assessing the, le the level of ability of the individual. You're not assessing how well you did in helping that person improve, which is the real <coughs> role of the university. The role of the university is not assessment. If it's just assessment, you don't need a university. To be blunt, you don't need a university. You just need exams. And you can put them in a different stream and you're done. University's role is to move competency up. And that doesn't happen with just single exams. We'll come back to that in a second. So this gets to rules of learning for motivation. How many of you set goals for students when the day they walk into class? You do. Sounds like you're into it. <laughs> and you're in which no one else. <laughs> which, which uh, what do you teach? How to tell you? What is it? I'm traveling around okay. Hong Kong, China, the world to learn something. I'm an ESL student. Ah, okay. Extra slow learner. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like you really know how to learn. <laughs> yeah. So I know I need to learn. Okay. And your name is University Motivate Me to Come from Beijing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody? know why goals are so important for learning? Do you actually tell people when they walk into class, when they finish class, what do you expect them to know before you give them anything? Okay. This is the number one thing you need to do. Set the right goals. The second thing is you also need to set the right right time period for them to get towards the goals. And this, to some extent, is based on the nature of the individual coming in. You can't set a goal, go to the moon, when you can't go across the street. You have to set goals that are appropriate, which means designing to work for groups of individuals where it will work just the right way. The second thing, goals are no good unless they're very specific. 
general goals, do well, means nothing. Do well in your exam, which parents will tell, means absolutely zero. Doesn't motivate at all. We actually know from the science of motivation, do well does the opposite. Does nothing. Okay? Second, goals are to be very concrete and if most important, you should be able to measure whether you are hitting the goal or not. So, for example, your goal for tonight's homework on math is you're going to get X number of problems right. It's a good goal. Do the homework is no good. Am I clear? Okay. Next one is always goals have to start. If you have a long-term objective, that's fine. But you need to have short-term goals to tell you how you're marching towards them. And the reason is, if you have these things, you can actually focus enough to make that you're making progress. By the way, when I said this, I'm not comparing it to other students in the class. It's a very Asian tradition that remains, is to rank kids in classes. Who cares? The kids who started well are going to do well. If they have an aptitude in math and they don't have an aptitude in English or Mandarin, the ones with aptitude in math are going to do well. What's the point? That's an aptitude measure. It's a way of entering people, but not a way of improving. And it's a problem across educational systems. And I just gave the same talk, by the way, in London, which is was interesting. And this was to educators at the University College London. And interestingly, the room was like this, about, uh, about five times the number of people. And I was trying to get it interactive. And interestingly, no one wanted to challenge me, which is what I want. I want people to say why you think what you do works well. Okay, these are, if you work in the corporate side, you know this is now very much common. Smart goals. So I don't know if you're from business schools, anybody? No. Economics. Econo I don't know about economics, but business, I think, is focused. Almost everybody knows that goals are essential for organizations. Okay. The problem with some of these goals is they do too much of it. Like anything else, there's a right amount. It has to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-limited. And it should not be too hard. If it's too hard, people give up and say, oh, we can't meet that. And it can't be too easy. You just have to get it right. And that basically means you start with something they can achieve, then keep inching it further out. It's called stretching it out. Stretch the goal out each time. You will get better improvement. Organizations know this. In the beginning, essentially now it's almost standard acronym. I would actually say it's gone mindless rather than mindful. Meaning, organizations have figured out, I just am going to put out goals. And I've been in many organizations. Every three months is a new set of smart goals. Somebody has decided manufacturing goals is an objective in itself. It's not a good thing. The goals are meant to achieve what the organization or you or the student needs to do. It shouldn't be just keep throwing more. It doesn't work. So actually, this means this part of the brain seems to be very, very important in making it work. It's called a prefrontal region. It's also called executive region. It does what decision points, executive function, etc. If you have a clear idea where you're going, you are, this part of the brain helps you formulate how to get there. So we can actually show if you damage this part, with a stroke, tumor, etc., that ability is rapidly diminished. And if older people, when they get uh, early signs of dementia, that's one of the things that starts to They make inappropriate decisions, they don't have clear goals, etc. So, interestingly, all that I said on this part, you can easily set up for students, you can easily set up for yourself. By the way, this is not for students alone, it's for all of us. You have to have an idea of where are you going in life. What do you want to be? We never do it because once you get into the routine day-to-day -day of life, there's so much going on you forget about it. So at least in Singapore, I've started to implement it with all faculty. I need to know where you want to go. And then I need to know how do I know whether you're going in that direction. And how do I set it up to measure that you're going in the right direction. And how do I reward you to go in the right direction that you want jointly with us. That's something that's worth it for organizations. The second thing is, after you have goals, it's no good unless you organize yourself to go towards goals. 
And this means you need to be able to monitor yourself. And we can actually teach kids how to do this. Um, and you can actually teach adults how to do this. Because after you monitor, you need to judge yourself to see how you're performing. And then you need to connect yourself to move towards the goal. Example of this, which is very common in kids, is they will say, I spent two hours studying. And what we usually ask them to do is to say, can you just go back and look how much time you were on Facebook? That is immediate self-monitoring. By the way, if they do it a few times, they immediately know the simple goal at that point is to reduce the amount of face time when they are doing homework. You do it before or you do it after. Reward yourself <coughs> with it rather than say, I can do two things. Because your mind is constantly going away. Your goal is not clear. That's what we try to do. The next one is I'm actually going to get into the simple rules of learning. Now this is actually based a lot, started with webinars, but the science behind it is overwhelming. Most of these are going to be very intuitive. How many of you play sports? What do you play? I play football, I play squash, I play snowball, I play many things. Okay, anybody else? You play everything, which is good. So teamwork plus solo, you do both. Anybody else? You don't play sports. <laughs> you play anything. <laughs> Anybody else? Yoga. Yoga, okay. And you do it? Okay. Ping pong? Swimming. Swimming. Much of what I'm going to tell you, if you play sports, you immediately will know this is how you learned it. And how you keep it going. <coughs> okay, the first and most important rule is nothing beats practice. Anything you want to do, you keep doing it enough times. The number of times you need to hit what you want may vary between a different person, aptitude. But the more you do, yes, you'll get better. At some point, you'll start plateauing, connected to your aptitude. We all know this, it's a pretty well-known principle from a very long time. And we can actually show that when you start out, the more parts of your brain are engaged, the more you do it, you need less and less of the brain engaged. It gets more and more routine. Now, what's actually less well-known, and this comes back to how you learn the sports to be really good, is practice. How do you practice? If you practice the tendency for many people is to practice what they're good at. Actually, if you really want to improve yourself, you need to work on what you're not good at. You're laughing. Yes. It's correct? I do. <laughs> you do? Yes, I only practice what I'm good at. Ah. Uh, well, in like a boxing or gymnastic, that's good for me. Yeah. So the issue here is we all have a natural tendency to get into doing what we're comfortable with. But deliberate practice, which is what any professional guy in sports will tell you, requires practicing more of what you know less and practicing less of what you know more. Very simple principle. Again, known for a very, very long time in sports psychology, but now it extended very strongly into educational. All education works the same way. Because the brain is organized to do it this way. Why does it actually work? It's a very simple thing. We have billions of neurons inside the brain, trillions of connections inside the brain. Those connections constantly change. They form, they go away, they form. Anything which requires you to get better and better means the connection stays stronger and stronger. And it's actually a physical process in the brain. We actually know the physical process. We can influence parts of it, we can't influence it fully. But the one main driver is more you use, the stronger the connections. That's why whatever you learn really, really well, like when you learn to bike, that stays with you a very, very long time. You can pick it back up very fast. Right? So this is rule number four. Time to iterative training is, again, this is what I said just now. We normally are essential feature of this kind of training. If you have a coach, by the way, they will push you in the other direction. Focus on what you don't know. Which is what is, can you monitor yourself to do that? 
and would you have the ability to push yourself to go in that. The next point, which is actually very important for what you all do and if you want to teach your student, this is the biggest single thing you can tell your students. How to learn. Okay, the most important part of learning is you think that I read and I read it again and I read it again. Yes, it is repetition. Yes, it works, but it works not as well as you think it does. And it's called the illusion of knowing. This is again the same principle. It's not novel anymore. Your brain says, I know it. Brain says, I know it. It's actually forgetting it. It's I know it, I know it. It's called the illusion of knowing. <coughs> However, if you do something very simple, whatever you're reading, close it. Don't ever take notes in a class. Come out of the class and try to remember everything that was done. So what I said now, to go back and try to remember all nine things, just the nine that I'm going to get at, nine important ones, you will remember it a lot longer than if you don't do anything or try to listen to it again. The effect is roughly 40%. Big effect. Just has to do with the brain is trying to force everything that it has already collected and keep it going. And the more you use it, the more you use pulling things out, more attention, focus, energy, and deployment of resources, the more it tends to remain. That's why recall works better than rereading. Okay, recall, which is best, which is what exams originally used to do, was recall free, free recall. But they're hard to evaluate for the proctor or the exam. So we go to cute recall. Put a question and you try for an answer. Works less well. Probably about roughly half as well, interestingly. Quite a big effect, drop off. The skewed recall, somewhere along you connect it and it works, but it's not as sustained as what you do. Okay. So the issue with free recall and closing a book is how many of you actually tell your students to do that? No. Okay. By the way, if you actually read your old, older ways of learning that they used to do both in China, India, and Japan, a lot of it was freely. Okay? I think before the advent of books, free recall was the best way to learn, the only way to learn. Okay. This is counterintuitive. Counterintuitive is, is if you want to remember for a very short while, crap. You want to pass an exam this week? Just cram. Okay. But what you cram will only stay for a very short time after the exam. The more you cram closer to the <coughs> exam, the less long it lasts. So they've done again randomized trials, so this is very easy to do. Just take your own students, come get them back six months from now, and retest them. How it did this for economics? Entire year of economics, uh, they ran the initial courses and then they retested them and they were just marginally better than somebody who never took an economics class. Marginally better. That essentially meant whatever they spent there, maybe they learned the language, maybe they learned the culture of economics, but they didn't really understand much, remember much. Very disappointing to the professors who initially ran the trial. Okay, so actually the counterintuitive principle here is remember the forgetting curve. When you're beginning to forget, if you relearn, you'll remember it a lot longer than if you learn just a very, very, just intervals that are very close to when you need to use it. So in other words, the longer you need to remember it in life, you need to have longer interval periods between the sessions of learning on something. It's counterintuitive. It's called space learning. First described by Ebbinghaus. They've run 3,000 kids in trials on this one in Iowa, and they've actually shown the exact amount, not exact, the rough amount of time you need, intervals of learning, to get what you need to learn. Uh, and that was. Yeah, but these these concepts are, are are related to um, memorizing or or role learning, but this. Does it uh, relate to uh, like the problem solving skills? Yes, and I'm going to come to that. But these are not the, these are the principles of how the brain works. 
But for problem solving, it comes to a completely different element, and I'm going to get into that. And those are actually the most important ones today. These kind of things are important to survive in today's exam culture, and I'll show you how to do it. But it is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the problem solving side, which you'll get to in a second. But these are basic ways of how the brain works. The other one, which actually gets to sports again, uh, and by the way, we can do all kinds of studies to show how the brain works for the spacing. Most imaging studies. Um, let me just say one thing on this. There's a 10% to 30% rule based on studying 1,500 odd people. Which means, let's say, this is interestingly when I talk about this, most people are only interested in this one slide, nothing else. Because it tells them how to pass the exams most efficiently. If your exam is 90 days from now and the subject that you're not particularly fond of or good at, you learn, the intervals of learning are 10%. Every nine days, if you go back at it, it gives you the most efficient type of learning to do well. Okay. Whereas subject you're reasonably good at, the range is 30%. Every 30-day learning works pretty good. As I said, this is the only slide usually when I talk to kids. This is the one slide they're all trying to write down. Unfortunately, it doesn't get at the most important problems that we face in that. This is another one that is not so well thought out and actually uh, counterintuitive, but it goes with sports. If you actually just keep on, let's say you're playing squash, and all you're doing is serving, okay? you're going to get good at it. But when it actually comes to a game, that doesn't get you too far. Right? So interleaving means mixing up what you're doing. You do more than one thing. So for math problems, it's been really very well done, quite a few studies. If you're doing a, if you just put out a subject and you taught them something, or it's actually true in economics or whatever, and all the problems are connected to what you just learned, they will remember it less well. And most important, they don't learn how to use it in the right context. So the very simple technique they use to overcome it is take whatever else they learned in the past, and interleave it with the new problems. So you have old problems, new problems, and most important, problems that make you figure out which solution you need to use. So this is the real world. So it gets back to the more close you need, get to what they really need to do in your way of assessment, it works better. Now the spacing and interleaving has very practical consequences for education. How do you set testing and how do you set exams? Testing, which is constant and interleaved, works much better. Constant meaning you're spacing it and you're connecting it both past and present and so making them make choices of what to use. In math, physics, computer science, and economics, they've actually randomized and tested. Your learning curve gets better because you're learning to figure out which tool to use for what, when, and where. You're not just learning how to mindlessly take what you just studied and apply. The problem for faculty is creating such things is a lot more difficult. So it usually requires having groups trying to build these things. That's actually the big problem. This is a whole different way of providing learning. And it does require an effort. And some physics has done a great job. They're trying to do this in a system-wide manner. They're actually focusing on it and building question banks that can be used this way. Uh, if any of you uh, have kids in high school and they're doing, plan to go to the US and they're doing something called AP Biology, the entire AP Biology exams have been rebuilt to look like this. Which has been interesting because all the kids who used to, because biology is always sort of memorizing. Those kids do terribly. They just are not able to figure out why they learned what they learned. They just memorized it, they couldn't apply it, and their grade just plummeted. The switching the exam happened unfortunately very abrupt. One year they were doing all the memory, then the next year the organization switched it to this kind of learning. And this basically gets to holistic training. Just like when you're playing a game, at some point, yes, when you're learning the skills, you learn the skills enough, but you go to holistic training at some point. You can't ever play the game unless you play the game. Very practical aspect, if you want to take big exams, 
you don't take isolated parts of that exam and test yourself. You take the whole thing over and over. Okay, because your brain needs to adapt to the switching. So if you're doing, I don't know, if, I don't know what's the equivalent here, but if you do an SAT, you're better taking the whole SAT than do every section each time. Okay, so this is gets back to problem solving because your mind is having to switch and apply, switch and apply, switch and apply. So how you test plays a big role in how they learn. Testing is a really good thing because it makes you learn. But examination, just as a way of saying where you are on the ranking, puts a lot of stress on the kids and actually doesn't do what you want them to do. Testing is a very good element of learning, very powerful tool. But when testing becomes the tool for assessment alone, it doesn't work well. It actually does the opposite because the stress puts people up. Some kids are naturally better, <coughs> others are not good in dealing with the stress of testing. As far as you're concerned, you didn't, you didn't assess how good a job you did. All you're assessing is the kid's attitude. Okay, if you old world, there are many ways of how to remember. I'm just going to say that this comes back to some interesting solutions that people can get up. How do you remember things? You all actually do better by linking it up to what you already know. And interestingly, the simple trick for memory, as many of the psychology people know, is you remember best if you link it to something totally absurd, totally moving, dynamic, and totally bizarre. If you really want to remember numbers, make each number something bizarre, and connect the numbers up together, you'll remember it. Because the brain works by connections. It connects to what you already know. The more you connect, the better it works. Which gets back to why you need to tell kids to apply whatever they learned to something they already know. The more they learn to think that there is value in what they just learned, they will remember it better. But these have been made into simple games for people to remember. And you probably have seen, when I was in uh, second year medical school and had to remember a lot of anatomy, I was one of those who learned to use these principles and I could remember textbooks of anatomy over a period of time just by forcing myself. No use to me now. And I deliberately don't ever use them again. But unfortunately in those days, and I think even today, those kind of skills are very valuable in getting you very good grades to move on to the next level in life, which is testing which I really think is most important is somewhere along you've got to inculcate the practice of recall, which is testing yourself. Very powerful technique for learning. And if you're teaching, people learn best if you mix everything up, visual, auditory, whatever. The only one word on this, there's something called learning styles, and people say, I learn better when I see, I learn better when I hear. True, but it's not true. What is not true is, yes, you think you're learning better, but you actually don't. The so randomized studies show no effect of learning styles. You may have a style, but it doesn't help you learn. Interesting, right? Because a lot of it is counterintuitive. Probably has to do with desirable difficulty. And a very simple study was done, I think, was in Princeton. All they did was change two things on a paper that they wanted the kids to memorize, so the Princeton students to remember. They changed two things, font size, they made it small, and they used unusual fonts, fonts that you normally don't read. Just those two things made how much they remember it much better. They call it desirable difficulty. Because the more you have to focus, the more the illusion of knowing goes, and the more you're learning. Okay, learning with concepts. This is something which is very doable, and it fits into your current many modes of things is it does work, not so effective as many other methods. Because again, basically what you're doing here is connecting it to what you already know, forming a concept or a mind map and connecting it. This uh, is peer learning, quite effective, very often used in medical schools, nursing schools, and I'll show you a little bit. Peer learning means, actually this is interesting. If I, what I'm doing now, we call as teacher on the stage or sage on the stage. What you really want is a guide on the side. We actually have, sh the data is quite nice. Teacher on the stage, like what I'm doing, works less well than a friend talking about it with you over coffee. 
very interesting, but it's a peer learning is more effective than faculty learning. Faculty should be the guide to building those things and structures. Very different model. So the big rule is, which gets back to what we started with, how do babies learn, how do kids learn, and how do you keep it going? The key is curiosity-based exploration. Those people who keep asking questions is the most powerful way of learning. And by the way, the one important thing about learning is, you're learning actually every second of your life. You just don't realize you're learning. You're learning every instant of your life. It is what you're learning that is different. You may be learning habits, you may be learning behaviors, you may be learning good things, you may be learning bad things, but you're actually learning every time. Unfortunately, when we use the word learning, we're talking about formal learning. And formal learning is a small part of real learning. The best learning is experience-dependent learning, where you come back and fit things that you don't know from formal learning. And actually, when you go to work in real life, that's what you're doing. If you want to be really successful, that's what you're doing in real life. You're fitting things, what you don't know, you go and find out, you go and explore, go talk to people, you learn and you come back. That's how you do well. If you isolate yourself in any job, you never do well. That's the reality of it. Uh, just a couple of little things highlighting. I don't know how common it is in Hong Kong, but in the US, you buy any textbook, it's highlighted. Very simple rule, which is interesting, is if you highlight, you don't remember. If your faculty highlighted the most important things, you remember. <laughs> okay, sum it up. This is summarization. The more you sum it up, after this is like recall, pull it out, we are taking everything together and rewriting it, works better. Um, so, Two things that I didn't talk about is there are two simple techniques which are quite effective for learning. One is called elaboration and the other is called self-explanation. Elaboration means whatever you study, now try to close it and connect it and build a story around it for yourself. Elaborate on it. Very powerful for remembering and also very powerful for using it for solving things. Because the process of elaboration makes you connect it up in ways that your faculty, teacher, somebody else would not have been able to do. It connects up to your experience. Another technique less powerful is called self-explanation. If it's something you don't know really well, put the paper down and try to explain it as if you're teaching yourself. That also works less effective than the full elaboration. But then all of most, I would say the majority of what I've said have gone through randomized trials, which is the most powerful way of saying does it work or not. However, the ones that haven't had the full trials are the ones that are the most difficult to do, which is experience-based learning. Because everybody's experiencing things all the time. How do you control? That has not been done. However, anyone who's got friends, yourself, you would, from your own reflection, know that is what you're really learning. Everything else, how much of whatever you learned in 11th grade, I don't know what all you did, you remember. You may have bits and pieces coming up, but you never used it, it's gone. Okay? So, medical school, we don't want what we teach to be gone, because you don't want a physician to not know what he's doing. So the approach we took is called Team Lead, it's called Learn, Engage, Apply, and Develop. And we use all, by the way, there are no lectures in the entire medical school itself, zero. Okay? So we started with zero lectures. Reason? How many kids actually listen in any of those lectures. How much do they actually, you know, we know the data, it doesn't work. So what we said was, all the content you want is produced into 10 minute segments, because that's the normal attention span of anybody. They are voice annotated, and they are loaded up on a website, and it is always updated, because they're very easy. every slide can be taken out of the new slide clip. And we can learn. And this is how it looks like. It's got a random axis. Let's say the, con the everything is annotated like this. So you can say, oh, I already know that. I just want to go to something specific because that's what I need to know now. You can do that or you can go the, through the whole sequence. Each slide usually is no more than 90 seconds. Maximum levels of concentration are 90 seconds to 2 minutes. Sustained concentration. platform we use called Gateway to Learning. Um, so the way it works is the, we made it extremely simple. The faculty just create the slides. They give the lecture. 
in front of a, their own computer and it's just loaded into the system. So you can update in 10 minutes. You don't need any technician or anything. Everything very, very simple to do. Khan Academy and all these are beginning to do this. You're beginning to see this come into schools, not so much in the universities, but MIT and everybody's talking about it. They just haven't applied it. Basically, this is transferring what we are doing in a classroom into the open format globally. It's no different in many ways except the delivery of it than the way of distributing papers in the old days before you come to class. Right? No different. That's what it is. But content has become very cheap, freely available, and you can get the very best globally. So Harvard in its economics course, the very first one, they're now giving it off to Colorado. You essentially go to Colorado there's a Colorado faculty who's very good in communicating. They use his content as a way to take the thing. So you are going to see this happening globally. Okay, so what actually happens in classrooms is this. We tell students, you come to class, this is what it's going to be on, you pre-work. You think in the class what you're doing is active learning, except if they had a party last night, they sleep, they're watching something else, Facebook, whatever. Then you say, I'm going to give them homework, and then you tell them, the reality, nobody ever studied the night before, because there's no, nobody's asking if you studied, right? And they come in, they get a passive lecture, then you think they're going to study, but the reality is unless you set an exam, they're not going to study. And they're only going to study right before the exam, so you didn't do what you were trying to do, you just thought you did what you were trying to do. So this is what we try to do, is take all the content that you need beforehand and it's high stakes. This is the most important element. The motivation, desire, ability, all those things come in if there are stakes attached to it. So when they come to classroom, you're going to see it in a minute, we first see, did they learn, and can they use what they learned to solve problems? So the classroom is an active testing environment. It is not a passive lecture environment. Complete reversal, so it means you're testing year-round Every class. Okay, now I'll show you a little bit of how it's done. We're doing exams. So this is how our classrooms look like. There are 75 students, up to 75 students at a time. The questions will come up on a screen in the front. And there's a timer. As soon as they walk in, they have a little uh, pad or a cell phone. And they have to hit the cell phone for the right answers. And what will happen next? So this is how it looks like. And immediately the faculty know, these are all queued recall, they're not free recall. It's a quick way to know how much do you know individually, and as a class, how much, which area did they have problem with. Immediate. Next you do, which is what is really powerful, is we don't tell them the answers. They go into groups of six to eight, and this is also true, by the way, in the school kids. Same, same way we do in sixth grade kids. They have to discuss with each other, and then they have to put answers in a scratch-off pad. The more they scratch off, the lower the grade for the whole group. What this does is normally they can get 70% by themselves. They go up to 95%. Interestingly, and we've now got several thousand of these tests, even the student who's the best moves up. The whole, whole group starts moving up. Reason for it is that group learns the student who talks the most may not be the one who really knows it. They learn to discount, which is what happens in real life. Our intent is also to get real life. You're in a ward meeting <coughs> patients. You shouldn't want one guy who doesn't know to dominate the whole thing. You need to be able to discount it. And you need to know maybe the silent guy is the one who knows more. You need to know how to value it. They learn <laughs> group dynamics. For us, that is, in medicine, that is equally important is content learning. All the questions are applied questions, meaning none of the questions test memory. All the questions test, if I give you this information, do you know how to interpret and use it? Every question is designed that way. Now, which gets to the next thing? They get a break. The faculty, by the way, is a parliament member who uh, facilitates a class. I can use anybody to facilitate a class. What I don't need is the expert in the classroom. I need the expert available. 
but in no need. So I had 900 faculty for 75 students. I have 1% to 2% of 900 faculty. Our core faculty would develop stuff, but everybody else are the best people in the field I can find in Singapore. Will there be any uh, peer assessment among students? Yes, every time they do, there's a peer assessment. And 5% or 10%, I can't remember the number, the grade goes to that. And they actually learn, we teach them to be able to communicate openly in addition to writing down. Because in real life, you always do suddenly performance assessment of people who work for you, work with you, etc. You never learned how to do it in school. How are you going to do it in the real world? How are you going to learn how to communicate good things to people? How are you going to learn how to communicate not so good things? We actually use actors to teach them how to do it. Our first three weeks is run with the business school. We bring in people to teach kids how to communicate, how to assess, how to talk about difficult things. Because we find, and actually, that's why I found your booklet interesting, because those are some of the key elements of the future. If you can't do it, it doesn't matter, because the pure content knowledge which we assess, the value, is, economic value is much lower than it was before. Uh, so this is the application phase. This is actually interesting, it was developed out of the fact all of this, by the way, is developed by my faculty. Okay, my role is cheerleading. My role is just trying to get, and also my role is to go deal with the ministry to say why they ought to let me do what I need to do. It was interesting. The first two years, due Ministry of Education were totally skeptical. They thought I was, I needed my head examined. Because right? they've done this for 100 years. And NUS is 100 years old. And they kept saying, why would you want to do this? Our students are good. By the way, we did another thing. We actually tested their students and found they couldn't solve. That, by the way, was eye-opening for them because they thought they were the best and the brightest. They were bright, but they never learned how to do it. Now, all of them are adapting the same thing. It's interesting. In five years, the whole thing switched. Application phase a tough problem. Problem is open. Open net, open book. You do it in small groups of six to eight. Uh, the problem has no solution and you can't find an answer on Google which means very tough for faculty to write. The purpose here is for you to think, be able to come up and articulate why you think your answer is right and the other group's answer is wrong. The purpose is reality, because a lot of medicine, like most things in life, has lots of known knowns, but even more so known unknowns and unknown unknowns. How do you deal with what do you need to do for a person when there's so much unknown unknown? So the whole intent here is to think about the questions to ask. One of the interesting things we are just talking about it is when I first went there, they all told me Asian students won't talk, won't ask questions. You're sort of like that. But <laughs> the way we found was, I would say it was less than one month, we couldn't shut them up. And these were Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, India, China. By the way, the Chinese students are the most assertive in terms of questioning from mainland. China. And what was interesting was once they got engaged, they would question each other, they were questioning the faculty, and the faculty learned very quickly that they better be very, very clear in what they answered because they were checking right away. They could very quickly and check, why you said this, but this is what it says here. So the faculty started to say they had to learn very fast. And they also had to learn to say, I don't know. Which initially, I would say again, the first three, four months of when we started in 2007, actively rolling it out, faculty had a hard time. But now, the faculty always say, I wish we learned it this way. Because they actually find it more enjoyable to interact with the students. Because the students are coming up with things they didn't know. The one thing we teach students is keep asking questions, which goes back all the way to the Greeks and Socrates. Questioning is the best way of learning. Questions don't need to have an answer. The question itself serves as a fulcrum to find an answer. Um, so what we did is we have gone back to the US, and we actually think this is just how we do everything in 10 minutes. And we also try to use big data analytics. And some of the other things we do is learning how to communicate, which is using actors, learning to read people, using actors. And medicine now has made it mandatory. You finish medical school, that's it doesn't give you a license to practice for life. US has already introduced, so every 10 years you have to come and retake. 
Okay, so medicine law is now talking about the same thing, mandatory retraining. Unfortunately, I don't think it's the right way to do it. I think you are doing it again like uh, mandating it from the top. You're not driving it. Uh, anyway, at least something. This is what we talk about it. The path is always driven with questions. And I don't know if we can make the video work. These are the school videos. Just click on it. This shows what happened when a school teacher went to work with uh, kids who had uh, learning difficulty in math. So Singapore, Singapore uh, streams students at the 11 years old. They stream them into which schools they go to. And these are called slow learners. <coughs> This is a school kid from the school explaining to other schools how it works. website where they say they want it. It's open. They tried. Other than surgery, everything else is open. Surgery is closed. There's a lawyer said they don't want anyone to think they can learn how to do surgery after watching a few videos. Uh, let me open Google and I will set the tab. That's interesting. You have both Chinese characters and I hope
stuff. on the left side and all the slides, these are done by the students. What they do first is they watch the content at home, very short content. Then they come to class and what they do is they get the problems, they work first individually and then in a small group like this to solve the problems. And they also get all the things very early of what the lessons are going to look like, the whole thing is laid out for them. This is what you need to learn, this is the time frame in which you're going to learn, and this extra help you'll get if you're a Everything is laid out. And then they actually get a guide on how to watch each of those content materials. Can you hear that? Can you hear? So one thing we interestingly found was this, that the kids were not watching at 1x speed, they were all watching it at 1.5. Because they could process it far faster than people like me could process it. And they figured out, so once you put the speed control, the 20 minute learning period got reduced to roughly 15 to 12 minutes. And anything they didn't know, they could play back. That's what they kept doing, which you can't do in a real lecture. Then the other thing they also do is this. This is what you're asking. They're given a chance to evaluate where the lesson worked, where the teacher, how they help other kids, peer assessment. This is sixth grade, 11 year olds. One of the most important things about any learning is immediate feedback. doesn't work if you give the results one month from now. Testing only works if it is very, very quick return of results. And so what works best is immediate. So everything we do is immediate. Because then you know what is it you need to know that would help you do better. And it's called immediate feedback. Everything we built is immediate feedback. And uh, the person who used this is a Each school does it differently, but the intent behind it is you need an individual assessment 
and the group learning to improve the Now I understand So interestingly, the, when this, this was actually filmed, when the Minister of Education of Singapore came there, and he, they ignored him. He was sitting in the classroom, the kids didn't even look to see who was in the classroom. He was so surprised about it because these are the kids considered as uh, not good learners. They were the ones they thought wouldn't move. What was also interesting, which uh, surprised him, didn't totally surprise me, was in this class of 25 or 30 kids, I don't remember the number, one kid actually could do master's level math. So they figured out all the kids were totally bored. He didn't bother. In the previous classes, the family was getting terrible grades, and they were putting him in further and further slow learning class. When they figured out after a bit, when they tested him, he was far more than any of the teachers in the school. He was 11 or 12 years old. He was just a math prodigy of some type. Of, and this is the problem when you put everybody into a thing, you tend to lose some of those. The other person was actually another kid who could do ninth grade or 10th grade, three grades above. So they had to figure out how to handle it because the school systems were built on everybody going like a poor, how to do it. So interesting. Um, but by the way, this, we built this as a platform just to make it easy for faculty. We also, so this whole system is now back in North Carolina for the, for the medical school. It's gone into, into physics, into biology, and economics. It's part of the initial platform for that. Interestingly, when you move higher up, like your graduate level courses, etc., many of the dynamics are good because your dynamics are getting much more to engage learning because you're already motivated, hopefully. Hopefully you're not doing a PhD if you're not motivated. Right? So the learning at that point is fine. It's already they, they're motivated, that drives it, they're engaged, etc. It's for everybody else. How do you get this done? So I'm going to ask, let you ask me questions and uh, your class, I think, actually you have two parts to it. Everyone got the course? So the course has lectures and the course has got problems, so you have tutorials, which I assume is like a problem. This was a lecture. Lecture basically. But just think of this one, right? You probably got, in fact, your content here is very interesting, looking at what you want to do. But I would suspect that almost everything you got, you're giving them things to read. And I would assume you can create your own short videos like what we did. And essentially use the classroom as a way to get the real learning done. But to me, everyone says it's too tough, too difficult, etc. This whole school thing, we didn't do a thing. We just gave them the platform. And this one teacher put it together in less than a month. Because all he did was he sat at home in front of his PC and did what he does every class. He put up his things, he gave his little lecture, he apparently put it on a Facebook thing for all the students, uh, which is quite interesting. He, we didn't do this, but he was using social media to communicate. Which is, the parents really got engaged, which to us was a surprise. He called me back and said the parents started to come to watch because they found the kids were not playing around as much at home. So the parents come to the class? They came to ask what he was doing in class because they came there an open day or something and all the parents came to watch what he was doing because their other kids were not in the same. And there's another version at a school called McPherson where the teacher actually completely changed it by connecting every kid to the net. Um, and the kids ask questions of each other on the topic. Different form, the same thing. And what was interesting is how I went to watch one of those. They were talking about smoking. And from there it went into how the lung works, how the lung is organized, how environmental changes. Exactly what you want, because it suddenly connects to the real world for the kids. And these were about ninth grade, I think, or tenth grade. And that teacher wanted to experiment, and uh, the principal apparently said, try it out. Now they're making it. The problem is, how do you, so there are 35,000 teachers in Singapore. 
So we probably hit one per second, about 300 of them. But interestingly, in about three months' time, in October, they want me to come and talk to 1,800 teachers, same, same exact thing. The purpose is how do you get all the frameworks, because the exam systems, everything is based on 50 years of the UK-based system, which I assume so. Hong Kong is also very similar to the old UK systems. The one thing which is very clear there is the top of the government wants to start changing. It's a good, that makes a big difference when you have the engagement. The reason I started to write, I started to write short thousand word articles in the newspaper about two years ago. It's a way to influence the uh, population to get engaged in that. Because my concern came from two things. One, we found the students coming in just didn't know how to operate by applying what they learned. And that is not good for medicine. And that's what started me to start writing. They actually just compiled it into a the newspaper made it into a little book and this Ministry of Education is starting to distribute it for their uh, uh, employees and all that. But I think they really feel this kind of learning has to come in. Doesn't have to look like what I did in medical school. If you just look at the rules, which is really what I would have done in a regular workshop, I would have given this first, what I did, on a videotape, had you all take it and then take your own class and figure out how you change it, which is what I would do. Normally that's what I want to do. I actually flip it to ask, you, if you know what it is, how would you change it? What structures do you need? What help do you need? Uh, interestingly, the technology is very much free now. And the technology you need to do is you don't need an IT to at all for any of this. Yeah, um, I'm referring to uh, um, the medical school at your university. Yeah. Uh, is there any um, uh, written uh, final exam? Yes. The licensing exams from the U.S. for all medical students going through U.S. medical schools, and they, these students, our students, did better than those students coming in with a higher entry score in the U.S. So the organization that oversees medical schools is called AAMC, American Association of Medical Colleges came to the school and made a report and distributed it now to all medical schools in the U.S. Because you use uh, the PBL, but um, I think it's supposed to... We don't assess, use PBL. Huh? We don't use PBL, we use TBL. TBL? Yeah. Because... Uh, TBL I, is too expensive. I, I suppose you, you should assess the, the process instead of the written final exam. Right? Correct. Uh, so we actually first assess the process internally. But externally, it's a license. All, if you are going to work in medicine in U.S. or Singapore, you need to get licensed. And the licensing is set by a third party, not connected to the school. But on the other hand, it serves as a validation too. It helps you validate. Uh, and the last part of the exam, it's called, there are three parts, is now built on application. Totally, the entire exam, is on workstations and it's based on application. In our case, our internal validation is we actually have patients uh, assess, I'm sorry, we have students assess patients in uh, actual settings to see how it works. We call them formative assessments. And we use it as a way to continuously, and it's not just medical school, after they leave, uh, Singapore is now implementing a continuing program for this. Because our fear is, Knowledge today is not going to be the same as knowledge next year or the year after. We don't want students to think that I finished med school, what I know is enough. We want them to be able to apply the right thing to the right patient in the future, which means continuously learning. So we're setting up systems for them to continuously, for the government, the Ministry of Health runs them. But there is no nature in the whole program, am I correct? Correct. entire <laughs> thing. The way we did it was uh, sometimes change is you, if anybody doing business now and economics now, if you try to change in bits and pieces, it takes a very long time. Uh, in our case, it was a once in a lifetime when you get a brand new school to say, just do it. And interestingly, 
I would say that was the biggest thing. But in, once we did it, it's amazing to see how others are adapting. You know. We have had 180 universities come over to look. That means the students self-learn and self-study the, yeah. the knowledge. Yeah. Our role is to guide them to continue to go do that right through life. But how about if uh, they really don't understand the difficult concept? Ah, so we always have somebody they can go to for tutoring. But remember the peer, peer learning, learning with friends, because we don't try to grade to see how good you are relative to somebody else. We want to see if you hit competence before you go to the next thing. So we can, you're not going to be allowed to go to the next thing till you're competent to go to the next thing. Because in the world of medicine, grading on a term matters not. What you really want is competence to do whatever you're allowed to do. Which is really true for most other professions, but we haven't done it that way in other professions. Medicine is not doing it. I think all US, Singapore, UK just came from there, they're planning to do the same thing. It's all going to be competency based. So they don't care where you fall on the curve. Aptitude. Aptitude and competence are not the same thing. Aptitude measures the ability to do things, competence measures your ability to act, measures your uh, can you actually do it. And that's more important. So what is the role of the faculty staff? A lot, a lot harder by the way. Because the faculty this is the hardest part. The faculty staff now have to use their brains a lot more than they did before. Because they really have to figure out how do I write these questions, how do I guide the students, how do I actually figure out what is competence in whatever you are testing or learning, how much level of application do you want to test, how do you create it in a way that connects to the real world, much harder. To us, that was the hardest thing. And I actually had to bring in, essentially I had to go to what I would call, depends on your field, but they always practice people, people are working in the real world, to come in and help the faculty to create those things, which is what we did. But uh, the law school is talking about the same kind of thing, to bring the lawyers in specific things in the real world to come back and try to guide the development of these things. So if, if I was to vision this, I think any top university that wants to remain in the top in the next 30 years has to go this way. Mostly because the jobs are going to demand it. Now for the best and brightest, the top 1% universities doesn't make a difference. Their students are so bright, they're going to do fine. I don't think Harvard is, Stanford is changing. Stanford is building its structure. They're actually saying <coughs> let's forget degrees. They're calling it the looped model. And they're going to do it from uh, the 2020 onwards. Basically means you can come in, do whatever courses you need to hit, go 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 back to work, do whatever you're doing, come back, finish, and once you hit the required credit limits, you get it. There's no time limit to anyone here. They actually want people to go out, experience what you really need to know, come back, and then learn what you want. So, but Stanford can afford to do it. It is taking that tiny, tiny 0.001 percent of the students. For other universities. Uh, I think the same donut that I'm talking about is true for universities. The very top end of the universities, it doesn't matter, they'll do fine. The very low end, which is practical <coughs> applications, will do fine. Community college, I don't know if you have them, polytechnics, community colleges, those things are going to do fine. Because they're actual skills based on The middle tier, their role and relevance is going to become questionable, unless you add value. And I don't know where you are, I don't know much about Hong Kong at all. But I, but I think it's a question of, if you do it in one or two courses, it'll start building, it's a momentum by itself. I mean, I've got to say the WMC, the organization that accredits medical schools when they first came, <coughs> very skeptical. <coughs> and interesting, five years later they came back and wrote a report on the whole thing, saying, and sent it to every medical school in the US. But to actually do it, you also need some kind of coordination. Especially if your faculty are stretched, because they're already doing, this is the usual problem, they're already doing something. To do this on top of it is very tough. So you need some resources to give you the transition thing to do it. And you may have to coordinate with other, so physics has done it interestingly. They work as an organization 
they're getting physics teachers all to work together. You know. Hope it's been interesting enough and makes you think. That's my only role, to make you think. And uh, also to really tell you this is very, this is fun. The faculty, I've got to say, love it because they are in here. They don't feel like they're coming in and doing the same lecture for the hundredth time. It's been very interesting to watch how the faculty's thought process evolves. Okay? Can I ask a joke? Ah, I'm not good. <laughs> That's, That's a joke. A joke. <laughs> thank you, thank you for watching. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, um, thanks for the sharing, and uh, please uh, help us to fill in the evaluation form on uh, how you think about this workshop, and uh, return to us when you finish. And we have a pop-up lecture uh, in the afternoon at 2 o'clock uh, in the lecture theater of the Central Library. And um, you're welcome to join uh, if you are free. Yes, how much? Uh, it's free. It's free. Buy one, get one free. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.